on a lonely planet slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Gale Mates. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Gale race one stranded explorer at a time. Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Blunderbirds in which Mark Thrym needs rescuing after Marcus House stole his lander. And as you can see we're nowhere near the Kerbin system. We are in Galileo's planet pack on the moon of Seti looking at Mark Thrym's uh, Kerbals. Or ger Gerbals? Is that what they're called here? Gay, 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 the, his aliens here stranded on Seti. Uh, which is the furthest moon, uh, like the most distant moon, from this planet here, which is Gale. This is all part of Galileo's planet pack. This is actually the first time I've ever used a planet mod, apart from that one part in Expedition Eve. So this is very exciting for me. I got a text yesterday uh, afternoon saying if I wanted to be part of this collaboration. So obviously I said okay, and then had to scramble together as some sort of SSTO fly a mission. I didn't even know kind of, I didn't even know what Galileo's planet pack really entailed, so I was quite relieved to hear that SETI isn't actually that hard to get to. From my understanding, it takes about the same amount of Delta V um, as the MUN in just normal KSP. It has lower surface gravity, but it takes uh, more fuel to reach because it's further away, so those two things sort of balance out and it's about the same as the MUN in terms of Delta V expenditure. If you want to see uh, the events that led to Mark Thrym's uh, aliens getting stranded on SETI, then there is a link in the description to a playlist that shows Marcus House's and Mark Thrym's videos, uh, and on top, top right hand of the screen now is also a link to that playlist if you want to watch those. In the description there is also a link to the music video for this mission if you'd like to if you don't like my voice so there's that and um, this is the SSTO we're going to be flying it's called it, it was it's kind of a prototype to a class of ships called the Wyvern which is kind of like a sort of part of my phantom class of SSTOs but it's kind of a bit more it's a bit more sort of diverse the idea was you could sort of swap and change out the three sort of cockpit modules at the front it's still a work in progress this one was originally designed as a Juno SSTO but unfortunately its thrust to weight ratio isn't that great and it ends up being very very it's not very good for Juno. I think I needed another nerve rocket really for it to be able to do that mission well. So it's a little bit overkill for SETI because obviously this was designed to go a little bit further than the MUN. So that's why there's a bit of excess Delta V in low gale orbit. I bet I'm going to mess this up. I'm like going to think about, okay, it's not Kerbal, it's not Kerbin, it's Gale, it's not the MUN on MIMS. So, but this is me flying it here. I, I, I really like this vessel actually. I think it looks quite nice. I'm quite happy with the way the aesthetics of it came out, which is one of the things I was trying to sort of play around with when I was designing it. I wanted it to kind of have, be practical and functional, but also to kind of look a little bit nicer. And I, 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 like, I like the way it came out. And here we are getting into low gale orbit. So in case um, some people aren't familiar with Galileo's planet, planet pack, uh, gale is um, just Kerbin. It's a reskin of Kerbin basically. So everything about it, to my knowledge, is exactly the same. So the surface gravity, atmospheric height, just general difficulty, or if you like, easiness to escape the atmosphere, it's the same. So if you wanted to download this ship but wanted to use it in normal KSP, it should work fine. You know, you don't have to worry about that. And we're here now getting into a nice circular orbit. Uh, I mean, like, our thrust rate ratio is not great, so all our burns are going to be quite long, particularly our initial burn to get us all the way up to SETI, but, you know, we have loads and loads. We have almost 5,000 meters per second of Delta V, which is enough for ELU in Kerbal Space Program. So I didn't really think efficiency was going to be that important here, so I thought I'd keep the video a little bit shorter and a bit more, you know, concise by just doing one big burn at periapsis. So this is me setting up the maneuver node here. 914 meters per second, so not that much in terms of our grand uh, total budget for Delta V. And there's a beautiful sunrise there. Now what you might notice, it's not happening at the moment, but a few times in this video there's this, been this glitch. I don't know what it is, is this just a quirk? I've never ever had this before. I don't know if it's just a quirk of Galileo's planet pack maybe, or if I just got unlucky, or I don't know. But the solar panels just sometimes wouldn't charge the batteries in this mission, so I found that F9 and F5, just, you know, quick saving, quick loading, that generally seemed to fix the problem, but I don't know. So you might see in parts the electric charge just runs down, I don't know why that happened, there's a little nice little cutaway there. So the way I kind of fixed that was just F5 and F9. In case that happens to you, in case it's a quirk of this ship rather than my game glitching out, I'm not sure, but that seems to do the trick. I don't know. Uh, anyway, we're getting to the end of our burn now. Mere uh, 10 meters per second to go. I was trying to, I was going to say a mere and then just watching it fall down faster than I could speak. So yeah, yeah, yeah anyway, so we're not quite at the right angle for an optimal encounter. So we're going to do a pitch change, um, an inclination change about sort of halfway uh, through on our journey, it'll be a bit more efficient to do it in deeper space than it is uh, the closer we get to periapsis, so we'll just accelerate up 
Uh, only a small 9 meter per second burn, so not very much at all, and it's going to be a very, very quick burn. Just watching it there on the map screen, and that's beautiful. We have a slight inclination to our orbit, so we can ensure that uh, the stranded uh, Mark Thrym people are going to be... <laughs> what is it? Is, it, is there an actual canological... Is that the word? Canological? Is there an actual name for the, the Kerbals in Galileo's Planet Pack? I don't know. We'll call them the, the, the Thrimmels. We'll call them the Thrimmels. So the Thrimmels are down there. Um, well, we're circularized now. We can probably drop our apoapsis down a little bit, though, um, get ourselves into a slightly lower orbit to make it a little bit easier. And we'll just switch to them and make sure we can... Uh, we'll just time accelerate to a point where they are passing, uh, where, they're, where they're underneath our orbit. So we're just going to time warp there. And that looks pretty good, but I think I'd, I decided it would be better to have them on the light side of the planet, as in where then they're rotating towards the light side. Just, you know for an aesthetic aesthetic reasons for this video. So yeah, I'm just gonna get a little bit of electric charge back by firing up the nuclear engines. Luckily, the nuclear engines do have an alternator in them, so when you fire them, it will just recharge the batteries, and you don't need electric charge to initiate an engine burn. You obviously just can't, you can't, you, you can't orient the ship in the right direction for it. So there they are, we can see them there, set it as a target. So I, I'm gonna do my standard lazy procedure of just alternate between burning radial out and retrograde and all the space in between. Um, to get ourselves on an encounter because again efficiency wasn't really an issue because this is a Juno SSTO and Juno demands a lot more Delta V than SETI does. And there they are. So I'm sure they are getting very excited seeing us gracefully swan down firing up and using the, rust, the last of our oxidizer because I was coming towards the ground way too fast. But I didn't really need it because uh, SETI's uh, gravity is very low. We don't we can we can take off just using nuclear engines. I mean look how much we bounced just then. I mean I did Hit the ground a little bit faster than I would have liked, but, you know, we have a nice big landing gear that has good crash tolerance, and, um, and yeah, that, that was, that was fine. So we can get Valentina out on a little EVA, go and inspect the Kerbals there, and do the most important step of Blunderbirds, and that is to, uh, take down Mark's flag, and put our own flag up. <laughs> so there we go. Planning it there. Beautiful. And there's the Blunderbuzz logo there. So help is here, Mark. Do not worry. Um, but yes, I think your Kerbals look like they're fine. They're still they're still standing there. And this mission has been uh, going on for almost two weeks now. So they must be pretty tired, but they're clearly able to walk over themselves. So we don't really need Valentina to carry them. And I thought I'd put them on this little rover here. It had run out of uh, electric charge, so I thought I'd just activate that cheat. And we can drive it off. And uh doesn't work, mate. doesn't work. What is this? This is... I mean, I did have SAS turned on, uh, and the brakes were activated, but whatever. Uh, we just had to walk us. We had to walk. We had to walk the way there. So just almost forgot to turn off infinite electricity there. Uh, we can just get them on the ladder. Uh, the ladder's just really there as a sort of symbolic thing because we don't really need it. Uh, even on Juno, actually, this thing was designed as a Juno SSTO, but Juno. Uh, although the EVA packs don't work that well, they do work. But just in case I wanted to ever take this thing to Lathe, which it would be able to do, um, it would actually probably be better suited for Lathe than Juno because it can use the rapiers on Lathe. And the biggest thing that stops it from being able to do, being able to do Juno well is the fact that uh, its thrust weight ratio is just abysmal with the nuclear engines and it can't really get out of Juno's atmosphere all that well. But it can get off SETI well with the nuclear engines. Uh, we can just see ourselves sort of doing a little floaty thing, trying to get ourselves off the ground. Let's do a quick bounce to get us in the air. It almost, if we just do there, we almost kind of ended up crashing. But I just cut the throttle and just waited till we rotated to the right orientation, then fired up again. Luckily, like I say, the surface gravity here is just so low. It takes a long time for us to fall back down to the surface. So we had plenty of time, and I wasn't really that worried. So... Yeah, not much more to say about this. You can see our apoapsis gradually uh, increasing on the top left of the screen. And, well, yeah, that's the um, that's the Kerbal Engineer. Sorry, I had a complete mind blank then. So, yes, in case any of you are wondering, the text at the top of the screen is Kerbal Engineer Redux, as it is in all my videos. Uh, the visual mods, I'm not sure. I didn't. <laughs> I just kind of installed Galileo's Planet Pack, and none of my mods seem to break. So, I'm assuming Scatterer is still working. Um, environmental Visual Enhancement is still working. I guess stock visual terrain enhancements won't be working because that's using stock, that's for stock planets. 
stock vision enhancements might be working. I'm not sure, and I'm too lazy to really look up. But that's those are the mods I have installed in terms of the visual mods. The other mods I've got installed are Better Time Warp, uh, Camera Tools, Vessel Mover. Uh, but I didn't actually use those for this video. But that's what those uh, logos are on the right of the screen. And there we are, all circularized and on an escape trajectory. So I guess not circularized, but you know what I mean. So there we are. Now we're circularized at. Uh, Gale, nearly said Kevin again, um, and I thought I'd set an, uh, a periapsis for about 50 kilometers. Is it 50 kilometers? Yes, 50 kilometers. I always have to think about it, like, is it 50? It's not 50 meters, so it's 50 kilometers. So, yes. So, um... Oh, there's not much more to say about that, really. I think I pretty much nailed that sentence, didn't I? So, yeah, 49,000 meters. There we go. Alternating between kilometers and meters. I know, converting kilometers and meters. What a what a feat of science right there. So we can just time warp down. I got a little bit overzealous and ended up <laughs> uh, glitching. Well, not glitching, but ended up sort of teleporting into the atmosphere. Can't believe the, um, the solar panels managed to survive. I think the solar panels work in that it's the amount of time they spend flying through the air, not just the act of flying through the air so if you're quick you can retract them before they break I'm not really sure but it's happened to me a couple of times where the solar panels seem to have miraculously not broken uh, upon deployment in an atmosphere so I think that's what happens so just activating all our control surfaces uh, trying to create as much drag as possible to force our apoapsis down we're now below 10,000 kilometers uh, so we're still pretty high up but not that high and we can see we've got that glitch again where our electric charge doesn't seem to be coming back so I, I quick loaded Although this time it didn't really seem to make a difference, but on the next pass, when I extend the solar panels again, it then recharges the electric charge. So I have no, I, I've, I've no idea. I've no idea what rhyme or reason there is to this this glitch, but that's that's something you might find when in this video. So yeah, I'm not using SAS here to try and conserve as much electric charge as possible, even though we do have quite a bit. So it wasn't really too much of a worry, and we'll just well look at that it refilled almost instantly. Now we're on the sunny side of the planet. So I have I have no clue. I have no clue what caused that issue. But yeah, we're doing several air brake passes. Uh, again, full clarification, this is at full uh, re-entry heating, 100% re-entry heating, uh, with all Blunderbirds videos. Obviously, I'm, Mark Thrum is kind of, I would I would normally have expected him to have 100% re-entry heating anyway, but for all, all videos, I do make sure that I'm playing at you know normal difficulty settings. And uh, yeah, so now we've got a nice low orbit. Uh, we have to just circularize in order to properly get our trajectory to the space center, so <laughs> space center setup. Uh, I didn't actually know where that was actually. I was like, oh yeah, where is the space center? Because I thought it was that black marker there and then I realized, oh no, it's, it's on an island. So I was just sort of trying to find it there. I gave up and I went to the space center and what I decided to do was just launch, just launch some random ship on the launch pad and then we can see that on the map screen so we know where it is. So there it is on the map so we can find it now when we're in our ship and we can set it as a target. So that's something that a lot of players recommend as well. Uh, well, I recommend it as well. If you're trying to get back to the runway and you're flying a space plane or you just want to get back to the Kerbal Space Center, um, planting a flag at the end of the runway or uh, even at either end of the runway would be good to have a sort of markers. Um, I've kind of played the game enough now where I, I can kind of know whereabouts it is looking as I fly over the mountain range or the little islands on the eastern ocean depending on which way I'm coming from. Uh, but as mentioned earlier, I've, I've never played Galileo's Planet Pack mod, so I, I had no idea. So this was actually, I, it, it, to be my first attempt, I'm massively undershot. But my second attempt, which is what you're watching now, I managed to get it pretty close. Um, well, as I, I got there, so I guess that's pretty close, isn't it? Uh, make sure we act, uh, deactivate our nuclear engines and reactivate our rapiers and put them in air breathing mode. Got a few temperature gauges showing up, but we're going slow enough now that we're not going to worry about overheating. So there it is there, kind of in this sort of crater lake area. Yeah, there's the space center there, so we're pretty close. So we'll just now activate some physical time warp to get ourselves nice and close, and then we'll just soar down. Now, normally this is what my general approach is. I just, you know, fly straight and then just dive down. Didn't realize that um, this mod pack includes G-forces, so my Kerbal was blacked out for a second there, or Gale's blacked out for a second there, but it was fine. And then my parachute's deployed. I must have accidentally hit space, so that was a bummer, so I reloaded. And we can watch ourselves on our final approach. Uh, get the resources tab open and everything like that, just so you can see for your own benefit. Although we have enough electric charge, we don't need to actually expend any more liquid fuel to get back to the runway. I think I did just, just cause, but we didn't. We, we could have easily uh, glide. I say glidden there, but that's not actually. That's not the correct term for gliding, is it? So there we are, deploying the wheels, and we'll activate the brakes and get a little bit closer because we do have air brakes on this thing. Have air brakes been buffed? Because I feel like they didn't. They used to be absolutely horrendous when it comes to re-entry heating. They would always explode uh, the second any form of heat touched them. But on this, in this video at least, they didn't seem to overheat at all. 
I'm so have they been buffed? Is this part of 1.3? I don't know. Maybe I should check. Nah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So yeah, nice slow approach. Uh, a mere, a mere 55 meters per second on touchdown, and then we can just activate the brakes and um, uh, just sort of hold down W to keep ourselves angled down and create a little bit of drag using the control surfaces. And there we are, brought to a halt. And with that, that concludes this mission, and I guess this what has now sort of become this miniature collaborative series. So, uh, thanks to thank you for to Mark Thrim and Marcus House for sending me an invite to this. Um, there's a full playlist at the top left of this screen. Top right has a music video version of this video, and bottom right was just chosen by YouTube's algorithm for you. For you, it's based on your viewing habits apparently. So, other than that, thank you for watching. Uh, Twitter, Discord, Patreon, all that in the description and enjoy the rest of the day.